Hey guys, welcome to Real Life Cooking. I'm Chef Lean. Um, we're gonna get started in just a few minutes. Today we are starting off our Thanksgiving series. We're gonna be making turkey cutlets and cranberry sauce, fresh cranberry sauce, and Brussels sprouts two ways. So it's all, well actually it is, a paleo uh, Thanksgiving plate basically. Just getting all my technologies involved. You know you can watch it on Facebook, Instagram, at Chef Lean. Um, I also, if you are new, I have all the episodes uploaded to my website now. So that's awesome. ChefLean.com if you want to check them out. Hey guys, welcome to Real Life Cooking with Chef Lean. Just got you started. I was just explaining to Facebook. It's our Thanksgiving themed month. So we are making Thanksgiving themed food. I'm like super close, up close. Um, welcome, welcome to my kitchen. How's everyone feeling? Let's see. I my face is like super close, but I like to say hi. Hey Kelly. Hey Drew. Hey Cole. Melissa. <laughs> hey TT. <laughs> You're so far away. <laughs> Welcome to Real Life Cooking with Chef Lean. That's me. And every week I show you a meal from start to finish to show you cooking. It's easy, accessible, and I really want to inspire you. Um, I don't always follow recipes, but I give you techniques and tricks that you can use in your own home. Um, Cause cooking is very fluid. You don't always have to follow everything to exact directions. Um, and now today, starting off Thanksgiving, my favorite month, it's also my birthday month. Um, we are gonna be making turkey cutlets, uh, Brussels sprouts two ways. We're gonna make a traditional um, pan roasted Brussels sprouts with pancetta. And we're also gonna be making Parmesan crusted Brussels sprouts. Um, for those people that don't like vegetables, that's a perfect recipe for you. Cause we're basically taking something really healthy and. I think delicious, but really healthy and turning it really unhealthy by coating it with panko and Parmesan cheese. And But we're not frying it, we're gonna bake it in the oven. So, you know, there's that. And we're gonna be, I'm gonna also finish off by making a cranberry sauce. Now along the way, um, if you have any comments, questions, culinary questions about what I'm doing or otherwise, uh, you can direct them down to the comments below and my technological guru, uh, TT, will be um, relaying those messages to me. So let's go ahead and get started because we have a ton to do. Um, first, we're going to talk about our turkey. Um, and before I talk about my turkey, we're actually going to get started on our brine. So a lot of people don't like um, turkey because they find it really dry. And the best way, if you're going to create a whole bird, it actually, and even like a chicken or a little Cornish hen, um, brining it is going to increase the salt and moisture within the bird itself. And it's going to make it nice and juicy when you're cooking it. So to get your, yes, question. Can we use the same brine with chicken or any other meat? Yes, you can use, um, I wouldn't, I know, I'm not too familiar with brining um, like red meats. I know it's done, um, but typically red meats are like dry, um, dry aged. Uh, but this is a really good, uh, brining like this method is great for poultry, like chicken, Cornish hens, turkey. Um, and when you're making a Thanksgiving turkey, like the whole thing, it's, if you don't do this, your turkey's gonna be dry because it's just a, it's just a dry meat. Like the breasts are so big in comparison to the thighs, and just it takes so long for the thighs to cook that the breasts that they just doesn't work out. And this really helps ensure the moisture. So what I'm gonna do to create my brine is I'm gonna put um, four tablespoons of salt into one cup of water, and I'm just gonna um, boil this. I'm just gonna boil this so the salt dissolves. And now this may seem like a ton of salt, and it is, um, but when you're creating a successful brine, when you're creating a successful brine, there is actually a specific ratio. And the ratio is one cup of salt to a gallon of water. That's great if you're making like a whole bird because that's a ton of water. Um, you're probably actually gonna even need more than a gallon of water, so just remember that ratio. But like right now, I'm only doing a small portion so I'm gonna use the ratio of one tablespoon to one cup of water. Um, and the water actually doesn't have to be actual water. Um, as you can see, we're actually gonna use apple juice, which is gonna even infuse the flavors even more. It's gonna um, tenderize acidic things like apple juice or lemon juice, um, tenderize the meat even more so, and they add flavor. Cause as that salt penetrates to the um, meat, then uh, the flavor penetrates the salt. Yes, question. What's the difference between apple juice and apple cider? Oh, that's a great question. I actually don't know the answer to that. I think apple juice is more finely refined, finely refined. <laughs> um, so for example, like if you were to just run an apple um, through the blender and then just juice that out, that would be your cider. Also ciders often have um, like spice blends mixed into them, like cinnamon. Let's see if this has, if it says anything. No, it doesn't say anything, but they often have like a mulling spices in them, like cinnamon, clove, 
just other spices that make them more um, smoky almost in flavor. Uh, and apple juice is simply just like apple juice with, I think, a little bit more sugar. I think apple cider is a little more natural of a product, um, depending on it. Um, so what we're doing to start our brine is we're just dissolving some salt into some water. And then, like I said, I'm, I'm using four, I'm going to be using four cups of liquid, but instead of just water, I'm going to be using apple cider. And now this brining process, I'm like being very, um, what's the word, like when you're trying to do a lot, trying to do the most, like always, very... Uh, yes ambitious today yes because this process normally takes like 24 hours or at least a couple hours it's same kind of idea of like marinating something you want to um ha if you have the time you want to take the longest time but it's real life i'm trying to show you something in a very short amount of time um so what i have to do is heat this up cool it down and then put my turkey inside of it um so i'm actually gonna be using cold apple juice to help cool this mixture down even quicker um also to our brine I gave you specific things to use. I said rosemary, sage, um, and thyme. But honestly, a brine is up to your imagination. Whatever you want to put in it, whatever you have laying around the house, it doesn't. You don't have to go out and buy extra ingredients to make a brine. So for my brine, I'm going to be also adding some peppercorns to my salt water mixture, and I'm going to add these to the hot mixture in the back because the hotness of the water is going to infuse, break, release all those um, flavors of the things that I'm going to be putting in. Now, throughout the weeks, I've used a lot of different herbs, so I'm literally just throwing all of those herbs into this hot water, too. I have some oregano, and there's really, honestly, no measurements for this. Um, I mean, I'm sure if you read on the internet, there's measurements, if that makes you feel better, like three sprigs of oregano, um, but it really, honestly, doesn't matter. You're just creating a flavorful liquid to um, infuse your turkey with. So I have some oregano. I have some sage from last week when we made our blackberry sage margaritas. Actually, I've done a pretty good job of um, using this sage. I had a lot of margaritas this week. Um, I'm gonna um, just, also I wanna just kind of rub it to release that flavor <laughs> a little bit even more. Um, sage is a very powerful herb, so I would err on the side of using a little less sage than rosemary or your other. We have some rosemary here. I'm just gonna throw those sprigs in. I also thought it would be nice to add in some star anise because it's an thing I just have in my cabinet. It has a nice licorice leaf flavor, which will pair nice with the apple cider, like that um, savory uh, note in the back. So I'll just add a couple of those stars. Isn't this, this is such a pretty little herb. Well, it's not an herb, spice. There we go, spice. Um, and I'm just gonna mix this around back here. My, so I have, it's like so salty. My um, pan is like solidifying back here. You can see the salt in it. All right. And so I have this liquid now um, that's really hot. So what I want to do to cool it down, I'm going to eventually put it in this bag. But to cool it down, I want to put it in a like something that's not going to break uh, while I add in my apple juice. So I'll just put it in this pot right here. And you can see, Titi, doesn't it? How does it smell? It's like it smells super delicious. aromatic. It smells like Thanksgiving already because we have all those herbs inside of there. And now I'm just going to add, because I have my one cup of liquid, I'm going to add my three more cups of apple cider. You could use apple juice. You could use orange juice. You could use, like, wine. You can use literally any liquid you want. Typically, I like to dilute it with a little bit of water, which is why I'm using the cup of water. I don't want to use all of the juice because the, the ratios of salt will actually kind of be off. Um... And then the last thing I'm gonna add is lemon. Now lemon is one of those things that uh, the acidity in lemon and citrus fruits in general break down proteins so much that um, if you are using lemon, you wanna be careful about how long you're letting your um, protein sit in it because uh, the lemon can actually make your meat sort of mushy. Even though it's tenderizing it, it actually can make it mushy. So lemon is a great thing to use if you're marinating or brining something for a short amount of time. But just be weary if you're gonna do like a 20 pound bird. I might even add in the lemon for the last like 12 hours, six to 12 hours, instead of doing it the whole 24 hours. So I'll just slice up some of this lemon. It looks kind of pretty too. And now my whole plan of putting in the Ziploc bag is kind of um, messed up now because now I have to like pour it in by myself. So I don't know if I'm gonna do that. Um, I'm just gonna squeeze some of the juices out of these lemons. And then I'm going to, Right now I'm just checking the temperature because it's so important if you have the time 
just let it go and let it come to room temperature by its own, by its own. But if you're doing it like we're doing it now, let it cool. And um, I'm actually going to use ice to speed up this process. Because if I were to put in my turkey cutlets while it's still warm, it's actually going to start cooking the turkey, which is absolutely not what we want for two reasons. One, it's kind of like when you were trying to rush and cook some like defrost some meat in the fridge and it gets like halfway cooked and halfway frozen on the inside. That's no good. But not only that, it's totally horrible for your health because at certain temperatures like pathogens and like salmonella can grow and create. So if you put your turkey in something that's kind of warm, um, you're actually promoting disgust and disease. And we don't want that. We want to be able to eat it and everyone be healthy and happy. Um, so I'm going to add some ice cubes in here just to cool it down um, because I want to. And while those sit in there, I'm going to talk about my turkey breasts. So I said, I got a lot of questions about turkey cutlets. Um, everyone's like, what are those? I'm sure you've heard of chicken cutlets. Those are pretty well um, able to be found in the grocery store. Um, turkey cutlets is not something that's so well known um, unless you're like shopping at like expensive stores like Citarella in New York or Gelson's, I've seen them in LA. Um, so basically they're just the work of for you because a cutlet is just basically a breast. <laughs> See how big this is? Um, a breast that has been cut, cut into thin slices. So even chicken, if your recipe calls for chicken um, cutlets, you can actually do this for yourself at home and save yourself the money. Um, so what I'm going to do here is take this. I just want to make sure. Can you guys see? Look at all this extra skin. Ooh, gross. And then to remove the skin, I'm just going to take my knife and just thin, like, as careful as possible. Like, I'm not cutting the meat here. I'm just running the... Oh, I hit the thermometer there. I took this out earlier. Let's take this out. We don't need this. I'll explain that in a little while. Um, so I'm just see running my knife off and the skin comes off super easily. Um, you could fry this and eat it if you'd like. <laughs> I'm not going to today. Um, and then, so now you have this breast. So this is this little part right here is a tenderloin. Um, that's going to cook un differently than the whole chicken or turkey breast. So you can just remove this and cook it separately and it's on its own. It's not gonna cook in the same time as your turkey breast um, or your chicken breast if you're doing chicken. And now I'm going to cut this. This is pretty thick. I'll probably cut this into two slices. And all I'm gonna do is just take my knife and similar to how I did the skin, I'm just gonna run my knife through so I have two cutlets. So we have this top one and we have this bottom one. And if you're really skilled with a knife, you could take this again and run your knife through it one more time. But this is a good size for now. Um, this is nice and cold, our brine is nice and cold. So now, all I'm simply gonna do is put my turkey inside of there so it can start to brine. Um, when you're doing this, if you're doing this for a whole bird, you wanna make sure the whole bird is completely submersed underneath because if any part is sticking out, the salt is, I'm actually gonna throw this in, it's gonna cook at a different temperature, but why not make it flavorful? Um, if you push, if your turkey is exposed at all outside of your brine, brine then it's actually getting exposed to um, those things that we don't want, like salmonella or disease and destruction. It's never a good combination when we're talking about food. So um, make sure it's completely submerged. I know a lot of people do that in a bucket at home um, if you're doing a big bird or like a bassin, what are those things called? A bat, not a bassinet. I don't know. A big thing, just make sure it's weighted down if it needs to be. Also, um, also you want to make sure that it's a non-reactive big thing. Like if it's a silver, uh, non-stainless steel bowl, then it can like kind of react or make a funny taste. So you want to make sure you're using like plastic, something non-reactive. I'm going to go ahead and get rid of this cutting board because it's full of, as I say, good things. Disgust. And I'm going to grab a new cutting board. And we can just move this turkey over here. <laughs> walk it over here my kitchen is a little tiny and we're gonna go ahead and get started on our Brussels sprouts so like I said we're making Brussels sprouts two ways so here I have my Brussels sprouts from the store Brussels sprouts are look at how big this produce why who is buying these like this much produce I guess because it's Thanksgiving they think everyone's buying like huge. so much stuff um so Brussels sprouts are something in the past few years that have gotten like They've gotten more popular. There are a lot more restaurant menus. Um, essentially, they are little cabbages. 
Um, they are part of the cabbage family. Uh, they grow on a stalk, <laughs> a stalk, and they actually grow all off of them. Sometimes the grocery store by my house actually sells the whole stock all together, which is cool. And you just pick them off. Um, how to tell if they are good Brussels sprouts, because a lot of times they'll be in a big bin and you can kind of pick out each individual one. If you want to spend the time to pick the best Brussels sprouts, you want to look for ones that don't have any blemishes. Um, their stem, actually where it's removed, if it looks dry, then it's older than if it looks like more fresh and wet. Um, so if you can see here. Normally when I prepare Brussels sprouts, I actually cut this little part off um, because it's kind of more fibrous and not quite as delicious. Now, as I said, we are making Brussels sprouts two ways. So the first way is a little more labor intensive, so we'll do that way first. And that's the more delicious way with the cheese and the panko. Um, first, I wanna just separate my Brussels sprouts do we want more cheese and panko, or do we want? <laughs> Gigi's looking at me like, oh. <laughs> what kind of vegetables? Is that? What kind of vegetables do we want with just? But the other ones have pancetta, so they have bacon. Mm. Oh, hard decision, right? Mm. Bacon. All right, so I'll do this many. I'll just move these out of the way for now, and grab a knife. And I'm just going to simply to prepare these. I'm just going to cut off the stems. And if a few of those little leaves come off, that's fine too, because they're like outer leaves. It's not the end of the world. Um, you're not wasting anything. Also, I want to cut these Brussels sprouts in half as well. So if you're just joining us, welcome to Real Life Cooking with, uh, with Kathleen, <laughs> with Chef Lean. Yes, my real name is Kathleen, but I go by Chef Lean. Um, we are making a full paleo Thanksgiving meal I've been talking about how to brine turkey, how to cook a whole bird. Um, right now we're talking about Parmesan crusted Brussels sprouts. Yes. What question. is your favorite way to eat Brussels sprouts? Mm. My favorite way to eat Brussels sprouts has to be roasted, um, mainly because it's like the easiest way to prepare them. But that caramelization that you get when you roast vegetables, it's, it just changes the complete flavor of them. And they're so, they're so good. So this Brussels sprout looks a little sad. I'm not gonna use it because the thing about Brussels sprouts is sometimes like little worms and things, I know that sounds gross, I'm like cooking, but it's on a, on a shoe life. Um, they crawl inside and so I'm just gonna throw this away. You can tell cause like it's a little moldy and gross, but only because those few leaves were removed was I able to see that. So I'm gonna, what was I doing? Oh, I was cutting these in half and now I'm gonna get ready to dredge them. So, like I said, these are a lot more labor intensive than the other way that we're going to be making our Brussels sprouts and a lot more dishes, which is another reason I don't like to <laughs> fry or dredge things very often. Um, so, you need three different bowls. You need panko, you need garlic powder, you need Parmesan cheese, and a little bit of cayenne pepper. Yes, question. Can you use any other kind of cheese or just Parmesan cheese? You could use, I could, I would say that whatever cheese you use, you want it to be able to be fine, like a powder, like Parmesan cheese, um, not like stringy or big. So I think Parmesan is the best in this application, but maybe like a hard cheese, like a Romano, because it shaves the same or it grates the same. Um, yeah, maybe, but not like a sharp cheddar or anything like that. That would be weird. Um, so we have a bowl of flour here, and we need some eggs because we need to dredge our Brussels sprouts. I also have a baking sheet prepared, um, foil lined or parchment paper lined. I'm a big proponent of always lining your baking sheet because it just makes your life so much easier. Like at the end of the day, you don't have to spend your life scrubbing away your baking sheet. All right, so cracking our eggs into one bowl. We have our flour in another bowl. And then, I wanna stir these up, oh, here we go. Just wanna mix these together so we're getting even coating of the egg. And then, we want to make our actual outer crispy layer, which we're gonna be using panko. Panko is a Japanese breadcrumb. Um, breadcrumbs are sometimes one of those things in the grocery store that you just give up looking for because you can't find them. Um, note to self, or note to you, they're often in the bread aisle, bread or baking aisle, next to the spices. Um, 
I've been in a lot of stores and I'm like, I just, I don't even want to make anything in panko anymore. I can't find it. So um, I'm adding some panko to my plates. And I'm also going to add in the Parmesan cheese, about half and half of the ratio here. Now, a note about Parmesan cheese. Do not ever use that stuff out of a green can because it's not actually Parmesan cheese. Um, actually, a few, a couple years ago, uh, there was like this really big conspiracy of wood chips being in Parmesan cheese. So make sure that you like, technically you should grate your own, but this is real life. Who wants to spend your life grating in like a cup of Parmesan cheese? Um, but if you're buying it like pre-packaged, look for like a reputable person, make sure you're reading the ingredients. A lot of the times um, I like to buy it freshly grated from the actual store. Like this is actually a brand like Parmesan, what is this, Bella Bicio. But like Whole Foods and Cinderella in New York, they actually grate their own in their warehouses. And I find like that's much fresher because someone actually hand grated that. This is maybe a little questionable, but not as questionable as the stuff from the green can, trust me. Um, we're gonna add in also some garlic powder for flavoring. Um, and when you're making a dredging mixture, always probably use more than what the recipe calls for. So I think this recipe was like a teaspoon. I probably added like a teaspoon and a half um, because it's so starchy that like the flavor really doesn't come through unless you over season. And then just a dash of cayenne pepper because cayenne pepper is strong. And we remember from last week, I'm not a spicy person. I <laughs> Spices and I do not necessarily agree. And then, um, of course, final ingredient, we want to add some salt. And again, a little bit more than you would even think to. And then just toss that around. Now, the first step of this process is we are going to dredge our Brussels sprouts in flour. Now, Brussels, this is like a great, these are easier to do than like chicken because I can add everything in at the same time and just kind of toss them around. And the reason we're putting them in flour first is because it's going to help the egg mixture stick, which will help the breadcrumb stick. If we didn't do this step, then um, it might just fall off completely. The other thing that I want to do is go ahead and grease my aluminum foil so they don't stick to my pan because that would be so sad if they look so beautiful and delicious and I can't get them off or half of them come off anyway. And my oven is at 400 degrees. All right, so now we'll just take each Brussels sprout and you're gonna get messy. Just take each one, you can do a couple at a time, into the egg and then into your panko cheese mixture. And I like to do a few at a time, so I'll get my hands nice and eggy and floury, and then I'll move on to the panko, so I'm not just getting a whole, I'm not turning my fingers into Parmesan crusted Brussels sprouts. There we go, so we have enough on the plate, and now I'll just move them around with my other hand so they get nice and crusted with our Parmesan mixture. Now if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. My guru, Titi Lyo, is looking at your comments and concerns. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Perfect timing. Question. Uh, what makes the flour stick to the Brussels sprouts? So the flour is sticking to the Brussels sprouts because the Brussels sprouts have moisture within them. Um, so it's kind of like an extra uh, protective layer by just putting that flour on there. And it's not, I'm not trying to make a thick coated like fried chicken. Um, it's just like to ensure crispiness. Mm. All right. It smells good. It smells good? <laughs> the Parmesan cheese? This. Oh, oh, TT sitting next to the turkey brine and she says it smells really good. And our brine is going to help our turkey not be dry, especially because we're using those turkey cutlets, which are like guilty. Most rests of anything <laughs> tend to be dry. Um, chicken, although if you watch the first episode of Real Life Cooking, um, we made the perfectly seared cooking or chicken breasts, which we did by searing and then steaming, which um, kind of kept some of that moisture inside. So yeah, when you're dredging something, it's gonna get messy. Don't believe TV, like, oh, if you keep one hand wet, one hand dry, everything will be beautiful. No, you're gonna get messy. It's just part of the game. Um, but it's gonna be delicious in the end, so it's totally worth it. And if you're doing the cooking, you shouldn't have to be doing the cleaning, so. Mm -hmm. <laughs> totally true, right? Mm -hmm. So we just have a few more. Um, any comments of your favorite Thanksgiving recipes? Because like I said, all month long, I want to do Thanksgiving themed food. So if there's anything you want to see, let me know. 
I definitely have to do mac and cheese, of course. Oh, yeah. <laughs> mac and cheese is like so many debates about mac and cheese. I can't even wait for that episode. Rue or no rue? Rue. <laughs> All right, last little Brussels sprout. I want to make sure it's nice and coated. And these are on a foil lined, foil lined, uh, Oil lined grease baking sheet. And I'll just get rid of all this. Yes, question. Question from Tramil. Are you baking curb side up or down? Am I what? Are you are you baking the cut side, the flat side, or the curb side? Up um, or down? So the question is, am I how am I putting my Brussels sprouts on this tray? Honestly, no particular order. Um, the whatever if you want to be like not calling you OCD, but some I know some people like everything neat and orderly. I'm a little more rustic in my approach, but just for your knowledge, um, whatever side is down touching the pan is actually going to get more color or more crispiness. So, I guess in this case, the best way to do it would be to put them face down because that has the most surface area and that will get crispy. But I'm just going to throw it in there and see what happens. They're like half and half right now. Um, it's going in a 400 degree oven and they'll be baking for 20 minutes or so. Um, as usual, you never really know how your oven is acting that day, like the temperature of the air outside. So just check them at 15 and see what they're doing. And if they still need more time, put a timer on for five minutes. I have TT the timer over here. Um, but timers are really important. It's so easy to get distracted when you're cooking and just walk away. Um, especially on Thanksgiving, like that's like the most worst thing. If you're you're in charge of one dish and you mess it up, like just put a timer on it. It'll, it'll really help you out. I'm just gonna clear off this um, cutting board and move on to my Brussels sprouts the other way. So these Brussels sprouts I'm going to do actually on the stove top, um, which is great because um, you can do Brussels sprouts. You can do the same recipe in the oven. But on Thanksgiving, a lot of times, the oven is really full of a lot of other stuff, like your casseroles, your mac and cheese, your turkey. Um, so it's nice to have some things that have uh, do on the stovetop and have some versatility in how you can do things. So for these Brussels sprouts, I'm actually going to do the same thing. Although a lot of times before I blanch Brussels sprouts, I, um, I actually just blanch them whole. But today I'll be, I'll cut off the stems first. And the reason we're cutting off the stems is because they are fibrous and not as delicious. Um, same goes with asparagus. Uh, one second. Um, same goes with asparagus. I had a friend telling me that she made tough asparagus and it's because she didn't cut off the like, you need to cut off at least this much of your asparagus uh, because it's just too fibrous at the end. Question. More of a comment than a question. Uh, Stephanie Garza says greens are her favorite Thanksgiving dish. Oh, greens. Greens are amazing when made right. Um, they're not so good. They are a bitter vegetable, almost like Brussels sprouts. Brussels sprouts are pretty bitter, so you need to cook them the right way so people enjoy them. Greens take a long time to cook, um, to break down and get nice and soft. Uh, they also welcome the addition of pork, but I know a lot of people are not so into the pork lifestyle anymore, so turkey necks are great too. Actually, greens would be a good recipe to try to figure out how to do quickly, like a saute of greens. I know like someone might be rolling around like in their grave or something, but it's I'm gonna figure it out, guys. We're gonna make greens a quick and healthy sauteed way, even though we all know that the superior way is four hours of cooking. <laughs> all right, so I have these second set of Brussels sprouts cut in half here. And what I'm gonna do for these is I'm going to blanch them. So blanching we've gone over before, hot water, hot, salted water, salty like the ocean uh, water, because you guys are all like, oh my God, so much salt. Um, this is our first layer of flavoring that we're giving these Brussels sprouts. And the amount of water to the amount of salt and the amount of time that our Brussels sprouts are gonna be in there is not gonna make them salty, it's just gonna make them more flavorful by bringing out their own flavor. So we'll add all those to my pot. Brussels sprouts take a little bit longer than most vegetables to blanch because they are like harder and round um, and thicker. That's why I cut them in half. But you do not want to overcook Brussels sprouts. Um, overcooked Brussels sprouts probably smell like the worst thing in the whole world. That's because they have a compound in them um, that releases a smell similar to sulfur. So like, you know, rotten eggs, kind of how it starts smelling. I actually had a client where I had to cook all the vegetables like super hard, like till they were dead like three times. 
and Brussels sprouts are always my least favorite because they smell so bad and it takes up your whole house. Um, so yeah, three to four minutes on our Brussels sprouts. We don't want to um, make that sulfur smell come out. And the reason we're blanching them is to keep them nice and bright and green. Even when we saute them, they'll have that vibrant color. Um, and Brussels sprouts are, like I said, hard and they're very thick. So if we don't blanch them before, they're gonna be like a little too chewy, a little too like crunchy um, for my taste. Maybe not, maybe not yours, but that's why we're blanching them. While we're blanching our Brussels sprouts, they have about a minute left. Let's bring over the ingredients for our cranberry sauce. Making fresh cranberry sauce. Yes, question. I don't know if you went over this already. What's your favorite Thanksgiving dish? Ooh, that's hard. It's so hard when anyone asks me, like, what's my favorite food? Because I just love food so much. Like, you can't go wrong with food. Maybe can. Mm. <laughs> but um, I really like mac and cheese. Uh, I really like stuffing. I'm about to, like, go through the whole thing. Um, I know a lot of people don't like turkey, but my dad makes a smoked, like, barbecue turkey. That is amazing. Um, and if you brine it before, it's, like, so good um and actually i like thanksgiving leftovers like i just i like everything i can't choose mac and cheese maybe but then like you can only eat so much mac and cheese mm -hmm. i don't know all right so for our cranberry sauce we have orange orange juice sugar and cranberries um so 20 percent of the cranberries we eat is in the week of thanksgiving as americans so it's obviously why is it important to Thanksgiving? I was doing some research and I found that um, cranberries are actually one of the old, um, one out of three fruits that are actually native to North America. So the um, Indians, the native people were eating them um, and they use them a lot like, that's another good point. Cranberries can stain things. So uh, be careful, they're like kind of like pomegranates. So if, I wouldn't be making cranberry sauce in like a white shirt or a white jacket. Um, also, if you leave them on the counter, they can stain your counter. So just be conscious of that. Yes, question. Question. I'm guessing this is for the mac and cheese. Um, do you ever use non-dairy cheese? If so, do you have a kind that you recommend? Or that can be a general question. So um, the question, I'm just going to strain out my Brussels sprouts and run them under some cold water just to stop that cooking process. Um, the question about non-dairy cheese. I am not too, I've never made a non-dairy mac and cheese, no. Um, I've made non-dairy pastas, but I don't really consider it mac and cheese. Um, I've used, a, what's this stuff called? Nutritional yeast. It kind of tastes like Parmesan cheese, if you close your eyes and think you're eating a Parmesan cheese. I'll use this sometimes on salads instead of Parmesan cheese, like if I'm making a kale Caesar. Um, you can also melt this into like non-dairy milk, like almond, just make sure whatever non-dairy milk you're using is not sweetened. Like don't try vanilla almond milk and then try to make mac and cheese. It's not going to turn out good. Um, but yeah, I can do some research into that. I really am interested in trying a recipe of mac and cheese with butternut squash. Mm -hmm. um, it makes it really creamy and I feel like the most successful recipes use that inside of it. Also, if you're in New York, random hint, Chloe by Chloe has the best non-dairy non mac and cheese I've ever tasted in my life. And they put um, shiitake bacon on top, bacon. So good. Check it out if you're there. Um, all right, so we have our Brussels sprouts back here. They're cooled down, and as you can see, they're nice and green, but they still have some bite to them. Yes, question? Yes, question. Can you use turkey thighs for this recipe? Can you use? Yes, you can use turkey legs um, for this recipe. The only, I actually wanted to do turkey legs, but the only reason is they cook, they're gonna take a long time to cook, so I don't have the time and the hour. But this brining and then cooking method, you can do with any piece of turkey, any whole turkey, any kind of poultry in general. All right, so right now I'm heating up a pan in the back. And um, before I get started on my cranberries, I'm, I'm gonna do two things at once, guys. This is how cooking works. Um, before I heat up my, or start my cranberry sauce, I just want to start crisping up some pancetta, or pancetta, I don't, I'm sorry, someone correct me, pancetta. Um, pancetta is similar product to bacon. Uh, it can come from the belly of the pig, and uh, actually it only comes from the belly of the pig. Bacon can come from the belly or the side of the pig, and it's not smoked, which is the only difference between pancetta and bacon. Um, also, in Italy, it's actually like a highly 
regulated product. Actually, in Italy, like all their things are regulated. Like if it's it's not pancetta unless it's like cured and it's done a certain way and comes directly from the belly. Um, I really like when I'm working with pancetta to try to find it as I just dumped it in. A lot of times stores will already sell it cut up because it is so fatty because it comes from the belly of the pig that it's kind of hard to cut. Um, so this is just the extra step I don't have to do is it's already um, cut for me. Also, you may have noticed I didn't add any oil to my pan. That's because there's so much fat in this pancetta. I don't need to add any excess oil. Um, one other thing, because we're looking for crispy pancetta, we want to cook it on low heat. I'm laughing because two days ago when my boyfriend was making bacon, he had the bacon on like super high and then I turned it down. He's like, why'd you turn it down? I was like, because you know, it needs to, it needs to render. Um, if at a high heat, you're basically just burning the top and the inside is still going to be chewy and fatty at a low heat, you're rendering out all that fat. So it's cooking more evenly and it's actually going to be thoroughly crispy rather than like crispy and chewy and burnt. And yeah. Um, unless you're standing by your pan, which I guess he normally does flipping his bacon the whole time, but I'd rather just like keep it on a low heat, keep a sort of eye on it rather than standing, um, going over and over. So I just want to move it around. So I know that it's cooking evenly and actually my heat is kind of too high as I just said all that. It does take a longer time to get the fat completely rendered out, but it is, trust me, a more superior, a more superior, a superior way of cooking pancetta or bacon, low heat. Um, actually the most superior way of cooking bacon is in the oven, but we'll talk about that later. Yes, question. We have a comment from your boyfriend. <laughs> I like burnt bacon. Okay, well, if you like her frame, use high heat, but <laughs> don't yell at me for turning it down when you leave me in charge for cooking it. <laughs> All right, so we have our pancetta going. If you're just joining us, welcome to Real Life Cooking with Kathleen. I'm making a meal from start to finish. Thanksgiving themed. We have some turkey brining and apple cider and salt, a lot of salt. Salt, you need a ton of salt to brine something. Um, we have our first kind of Brussels sprouts in the oven, roasting up with Parmesan and panko. And we are rendering some pancetta in this pan for our second set of Brussels sprouts. And while that's going, I want to go ahead and get my cranberry sauce going. Now, this is literally the easiest thing you will make for Thanksgiving. So if you are not a good cook, volunteer to make the cranberry sauce. And cranberry sauce gets a bad rap. I don't know why. Like, I love cranberry sauce. I think because people think you have to have it because your meat is dry. Cranberry sauce goes on everything. It goes on stuffing. It goes, if you have less leftover, you can make it on a sandwich. So good. Yes, question. Question, how long are you cooking the pancetta? Um, so I'm gonna cook it until it's done. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> cooking is active, we have to watch. But if you need a time, um, about, how long have I been cooking now? Like two minutes? two minutes? I would say like five to six minutes on low heat um, because it's so small, it should crisp up. And you'll know visual cues to look for is it'll change color. It'll start to get more caramelized in color. Um, there'll be a lot more grease in the pan because all that fat has rendered out. And that's pretty much all you're gonna all you're gonna be looking for. Where did I just put my? Oh, here we go. All you're really looking for. And um, you do want to stir it around from time to time so it doesn't burn and the heat is getting distributed evenly throughout the whole thing. But it starts off as a really pink color and it's gonna turn a little bit more brown, just like when you're cooking meat. So I added all those cranberries to my pot and I'm gonna add in some orange juice now. About a cup of orange juice. Less is more when you're thinking about liquid because the cranberries are actually going to release a ton of liquid. So you don't need a lot of liquid in here. Um, also, I'm gonna add sugar. Now I know, for those of you guys that want measurements, I don't have them, okay? But like, in general, one pack of cranberries, a cup of sugar is a good place to start. Um, if you like things less uh, sweet, then add a little bit less. If you like things more sweet, um, add a little bit more. But I would suggest starting with a cup of sugar, cooking it down, and then seeing how you feel about it. I'm gonna say I'll probably add like, that's like a cup and a half or so. And then I'm gonna start this on the heat while I continue talking about what I'm gonna do next because this is gonna take a little bit to cook down. And what's cool about cranberries is kind of like popcorn as they cook, they'll start popping and it's like exciting. Um, all right, so the other thing I wanna add to this is we added orange juice. Um, I wanna echo that orange flavor by adding even more orange essence by adding in some orange zest. Now. <laughs> Woo, my uh, zester, not my zester, my peeler just broke. Um, but no fear, because I have two. Except for this one has a little blue thing on it, so. 
Now you can use um, just a regular microplane if you want to use that, but I think it looks pretty microplane if you don't know what that is, RAS grater. Monique, here's a chance for you to use your uh, RAS grater again. Um, so you can just do that and it'll get like a nice fine orange zest. But for this recipe, because your Thanksgiving is all about presentation too, right? So I think if you peel off some nice pieces of orange, it looks really pretty in there and you're still getting that same essence that you're gonna get um, if you microplane it. And I'm sure everyone has a peeler, right? Yes. Everyone has a peeler. If you don't, you should. All right, so I'm just gonna take off some big pieces of orange and I'm gonna add in those. Now cranberry sauce is another thing you can get really creative with. You could add a cinnamon stick, you could add some lemon zest, you can add um, jalapeno if you want like a spicy, sweet, tangy sort of sauce. Um, it's really a place to get creative, just whatever you like. Add it on in, add some sugar, add a little bit of liquid, and just let it boil down into, until it becomes jellyish. All right, let's move this way. I feel like I'm making a giant mess. Oh, it's been 15 minutes, thank you. Let's check on our Brussels sprouts in the back here. I feel like they're getting a little crispy. So remember, I said, this recipe said 20 minutes, but these, they're on the bottom rack right now. They're getting really crispy, so I'm gonna actually rotate them, and they're not crisping up all around. My oven is bootleg. I hope your oven is better than mine. Um, but that's why it's important to watch and what you're doing. As I'm talking about watching what I'm doing, let's move around our pancetta. Um, so I'm just gonna move these to the top rack and let them finish cooking because they're getting really toasted on the bottom, but not so toasted on the top, and I want them to be even. The only thing is, is I have some potatoes roasting in the oven, so I gotta move those out the way. Ooh, these are nice and crispy. So we'll put those on the top. Um, that's a good point about cooking in your oven. Um, whatever's on closest to the bottom is gonna brown from the bottom faster, and whatever's closer to the top is going to brown from the top faster. Um, if you have convection, if you've heard of that, that's because there's a fan blowing in convection and that air is circulating around, which actually um, creates more even heat than just the top and bottom heat sort of situation. All right, so our pancetta looks different now. So all I'm gonna do now is remove it from the pan because I don't wanna burn it. And if I were to continue to cook it now, it would just get burnt. So let's take this out. But I'm gonna remove it in a way that I'm trying to keep most of this grease in here because that's what we wanna cook our Brussels sprouts in. Again, we wanna take something really healthy and make it super unhealthy. Not super unhealthy. It's holidays, of course. All right, so we'll remove all of that. And now we'll put it back on the heat. And now it was on low to render out the pancetta. Um, I'm gonna turn it up to high because now what I wanna do is caramelize my Brussels sprouts. I also wanna turn this up my cranberry sauce back here. I'm gonna put a lid on my cranberry sauce just so it can start heating up because again, my stove is bootleg and I only have one good burner. So this little burner back here is like chugging along ever so slowly. So anytime you put a lid on something, it's gonna help it retain the heat faster and cook faster. So our second round of Brussels sprouts, we have our grease in here from our pancetta and I'm just going to add in my Brussels sprouts. Um, and I'm not gonna move them. I'm gonna just sit here and talk to you. What do you guys wanna talk about? Yes, question. What's the best way to reheat food that you cook so that it's crispy, like a crispy exterior? So that's a great question that I think a lot of people struggle with. I'm just salting my Brussels sprouts. Again, more salt than you think. Um, that's a great question. How do you reheat something that you want to be crispy? I have to bear the bad news to you that cooking, um, reheating something that's crispy is never gonna be the same as the first time you ate it but the best way to reheat something is actually in the oven. Because of that even heat, um, it's gonna like crisp it up rather than the microwave a lot of times makes things soggy. If you really wanna like go the extra step of making it really crispy, um, I would suggest even using a baking rack when you heat it up so there's not um, moisture coming, like cre getting created from the bottom layer and it'll be crispy all around. All right, so like I said, um, we want to create caramelization with these Brussels sprouts. Um, so we want to not touch them because if I touch them, they're gonna start getting moisture around them and they're not going to cut, uh, they're not going to get the caramelization that I want. As I say that, I, just, I also don't want them to burn, so it's kind of like a, it's a, 
a balance, right? Don't touch them too much, but make sure that you're not burning them. Although Brussels sprouts are one of those things that kind of taste good, sort of burnt. Um, all right, I think our other Brussels sprouts are done now. So I'm gonna pull these out. Nice and crispy. Um, these you can serve by themselves, or uh, if you have like some ranch or Caesar dressing, that would be really good. Um, I just want to remove them from the baking sheet as quickly as possible because if they sit on the baking sheet, they're going to get moisture and they're going to become uncrispy. So we just did all this work to make them crispy, and then they won't be. So let's go ahead and remove them from that. From this. And I want to remove them onto something that has a lot of surface area. So if I were to put these all in a bowl while they're hot, that would create moisture again. And then they would not be crispy. Take these off. And then just set these to the side. The last thing we need to do to create our Thanksgiving feast is cook our turkey. But um, as you saw, I wanted to have the most amount of time brining as possible. So I would say it's been brining, what, like 40 minutes 40 or minutes. so? Gonna move these over here. TT, don't touch them. <laughs> and to cook my turkey, I'm gonna move my Brussels sprouts to the back. And again, not really touching them. To cook my turkey, I'm going to use my scan pan. Um, it has a good amount of weight. Hopefully, my turkey will brown. And going over the steps of searing again. I've gone over this a few times in this show. Um, searing, the most important thing is super high heat to the point where like you want your kitchen to be smoking. Um, that means you're doing it right. Good job. Don't, don't fret if your kitchen is smoking away. Um, also you want whatever you are searing to be pretty removed of moisture, which is interesting. Like I said, I was being very ambitious brining something. Um, if you were brining a whole turkey, you'd want to brine it and then actually let it sit like um, without the brine, rinse it off and let it sit without the brine for at least an hour so it can get tacky so the skin is nice and dry so then that sear can be created in the oven. Um, we are doing everything speedy style today. So, and because turkey hasn't been sitting in the brine that long, I'm not even going to rinse it off because I don't think it'll be that salty. <laughs> at least let's hope it won't be that salty. Um, but as you can see, hopefully you can see, the turkey has actually kind of changed color even a little bit. Like, can you guys see? Well, maybe not, but it's like a little more white and that uh, salt and sugar from the apple juice has started to go into it. So I'm just gonna take that out and then take this one out and our little tenderloin is in here still. Now this brine cannot be reused. Um, sadly, you just have to throw it away, which is why like if you wanted to use wine or something like that, I wouldn't suggest using the most expensive bottle of wine because you're just gonna throw that away. All right, so I'm just gonna pack these dry and at this point, I know we're making turkey cutlets, but at this point, if you're making your whole turkey, after you let it um, sit and dry off for a little while, you um, would wanna rub it down with even more seasoning. So whatever dry rub that you like uh, is a perfect, just, just slather it on, just make it, season it up so it has that extra layer of flavor. Oh, my Brussels sprouts back here. Good time to move them, yep, perfect timing. And our cranberry sauce, now that it has the lid, is bubbling away. So I'm gonna turn it up and actually give it a stir around. Yep, doing great back here. Cranberry sauce typically takes about 15 to 20 minutes to make, so all those cranberries pop open and then it will reduce enough. So I took off the lid now because we want the liquid to reduce down. That's how it's gonna become thick. If we don't reduce it down, it's not gonna become thick and it's gonna be just like syrupy weirdness. So yes, wanna make sure that you're just cooking them long enough. I think our Brussels sprouts are pretty good back here. They're looking delicious. So I'm gonna turn off that heat. Um, at that point, if you have some sort of vinegar, balsamic vinegar, red wine, you can add in some of that and I'll just add an extra splash of flavor. But let's sear our turkey. So to our pan, our pan is super hot. I'm gonna add a little bit of oil. You can be a little generous when you're making turkey because there's not a lot of fat. It's a super lean protein, which is why oftentimes it's very dry. Um, but we did our brine, so hopefully we will avoid that. And I'm only gonna cook one of these breasts because the other thing when you're searing something, 
the other thing when you're searing something is that um, you don't want to overcrowd your pan. If you overcrowd your pan, you're going to create moisture, and moisture is the enemy of searing. So, yes, one. I'm only going to cook one. Sorry, only one of you gets to eat today. Lie. Oh, actually, I didn't even do what I said. Add a dry rub of some sort. Actually, I think I'm just gonna use a little bit of smoked paprika because the paprika is going to balance that sweetness of um, the apple juice that we use. But this is a great place to use like a store-bought rub. All right. Ah! So, clearly my pan was hot enough. Awesome. Um, and again, now that I put it in the pan, I'm not touching it. I don't wanna to touch it because what I'm doing is creating a Maillard reaction, which actually tricks your brain, that makes the color, and it tricks your brain into creating saliva. Like if you see a piece of brown um, seared meat, like a steak or a really crispy chicken or turkey, your brain automatically thinks it's delicious. It could be raw on the inside, but your brain is like already like, wow, that looks so good. So you really wanna create that color. If you have a cast iron skillet, best thing to use in this instance. Um, I have my scam pan going. Oh, my cranberry uh, sauce is boiling way back here. This is something that can boil over, so make sure you're watching your heat. It doesn't really have to be at the highest temperature like it is now. I'm just rushing things a little bit, so um, we can go about our merry way. But um, at this point, you wanna taste your cranberries and see how the sugar content it is. Now remember, it's hot, so be careful. I'm just tasting a little bit of the juice. That's pretty good. A little more sweet than I actually would like it, but I love the Christopher, so he'll love it. Um, all right, now I'm gonna check uh, my turkey. Oh, it looks so beautiful. I wanna also sprinkle some more paprika on this side so it can be flavored throughout. There we go. It's looking so Amazing. Yes, question. Um, if you add more orange juice to the cranberries, will that make it less sweet? Is uh, there anything you can do? No, the only thing to make your cranberry sauce less sweet is add less sugar at the beginning. So instead of a cup, which is my recommended amount for general taste buds, I would start with maybe like a half cup or a fourth cup. Or you could even use like a different sweetener, like a stevia, if you're like really watching sugar con or intake, or um, a monkfish sugar, or agave or honey. Any sweetener, maple syrup even, um, any sweetener will do. And like I said, you can play around with your cranberry sauce and add in like different herbs. You can add thyme, orange, lemon, grapefruit. Play around and see what you like. Um, cooking is just for you when you're cooking for yourself, so it just needs to taste good to you. All right, so our turkey. Let's talk about turkey cookery. Um, when you're cooking a whole bird, uh, you have, a lot of times they come with these pop-up timers because just like chicken, turkey needs to be cooked to exactly 165 because it can be um, carrying salmonella. If you don't have one of these little pop-up things, you can um, have your own thermometer, obviously. You wanna check it in several different places, not touching the bone, making sure that it's at 165 exactly. Um, and you wanna make sure that you leave yourself enough time. Turkeys come frozen, so leave yourself enough time to defrost your turkey, leave yourself enough time to brine your turkey, and leave yourself enough time to cook your turkey and think about all the other dishes that you're making. So, you know, maybe you need to cook your turkey early in the morning so then your mac and cheese and stuffing can go in if you don't have enough space. Um, Thanksgiving is, can be very intimidating and overwhelming, but with a little bit of planning, I'm sure your turkey will come out perfectly well. Um, also, this is a great method for even just a roasted chicken um, if you're not gonna be doing your Thanksgiving cooking at home. Um, all right, so, I'm not even gonna attempt this turkey cutlet. It's probably gonna cook about four minutes on each side. A way that you can tell your poultry is done without a thermometer is you can just press it and it'll give a little bit if it's not cooked. It's more like a trampoline. And the places that it's cooked are gonna be a lot more firm. So right here on this edge, it's cooked. But right here in the middle, definitely not cooked at all. So let's start plating everything else up while we wait for our turkey to finish cooking. I cheated today and I made some roasted potatoes. All right, so Brussels sprouts. Before we plate them, of course we need to taste them. They're hot. 
put it in. And in our pancetta. And like I said, for just a splash of acidity, I'm gonna add a little bit of red wine vinegar. Yes, question. Yeah, question. Can you talk a little bit more about brining other meats like chicken? So brining other meats is exactly the same process as brining turkey, but because the chicken is smaller, let me cover, close my ugly cabinet. Because the chicken is smaller, I'm gonna turn down the heat. You're not gonna need to brine it for as long, maybe just up to four hours, um, but all the flavors and things can be exactly the same. All right, so let's put some of our pancetta pan roasted Brussels sprouts. You see that beautiful caramelization color. And then, where are, oh, I forgot they're over here. We have our Parmesan, they're so crispy. This is exactly what you want. You could like throw them at someone and knock them out. Put our Parmesan crusted Brussels sprouts over here. Again, perfect for like someone that's paleo. Although you, I guess you can eat bread, right? Paleo no, people don't eat bread. Don't eat bread. Just toss them with some Parmesan cheese and call it a day. And then we'll go ahead and slice up our turkey. In a perfect world, what do we like to do with our meats when they are done um, cooking? Let is, them rest. Yes, we like to let them rest so all those pieces can go back inside and you know, it just creates a much better texture and taste. So I'm just going to, I'm just gonna leave this whole today. Put this on top. And then last but not least, we have our cranberry sauce, which right now it is super hot so, you know, when things are hotter, they're not going to gel. But as this cools, it'll get more gel. Now, if you make cranberry sauce and it doesn't gel, no need to fear. Just put it back in a pot and cook it down a little bit longer. It's just because not enough liquid has evaporated, so it hasn't become a jelly. But like I said, today I was very ambitious, making all these things that take just a little bit more time. Um, but I want to show you guys some Thanksgiving techniques that you can take with you. Like I said, if you're not a great cook, this cranberry sauce is the thing to bring. Be the claim to frame for clam cranberry sauce in your family. And it is important. Oh my gosh, it looks so beautiful. All right, so here we have our Brussels sprouts two different ways. We have our crispy Parmesan Brussels sprouts right here, yum. Our pan roasted ones right here, we got some nice color. Our turkey breast that we brine, so when I cut into it, it's gonna taste delicious. And our cranberry sauce right on top. Um, thank you guys for joining me today on Real Life Cooking. Uh, all month long, we'll be doing Thanksgiving themed recipes. Let me know if you want to see anything. Please share, like, let me know what you want to see. It's all about you, getting you inspired, getting you back in the kitchen. See you guys later. I always say bye and then I'm like, hey. <laughs>